Hello, I'm Sachi Inari Rizzo, Curator of Prints and Drawings. Every other month, they present a talk in the Print and Drawing Study Center and offer it virtually. For this season, we've been looking at the post-World War II print renaissance in the U.S., seen in the proliferation of printmaking workshops, their interconnections, and the artists with whom they are making some of the most exciting prints that we see today. In September, November, and January, we looked at print shops that were for-profit businesses, as well as examples of nonprofits associated with universities, whose mission included an educational component. Printmaking has a long history of exploring social issues, all for the service of the people. Today, we will look at examples of printmaking workshops that are community-centered, meaning that the print shops have become an integral part of the communities that they are serving. I am fascinated by the connections between these studios. It is reminiscent of a family tree. To talk about community-centered print workshops, I would like to begin with an influential individual named Corita Kent. Corita Kent, also known as Sister Mary Corita, was a Catholic nun, teacher, and surprisingly a pop artist. In 1936, she entered the Roman Catholic Order of the Sisters of the Immaculate Heart of Mary in Los Angeles. She studied at the Immaculate Heart College and attended University of Southern California for graduate school, where she studied art history. Kent began screen purging during this time. But first, before we go any further, let's do a quick rundown on screen printing. The, the essential concept behind making a screen print is the use of a stencil. Areas of the screen are masked by a stencil to produce the design. The stencil will block areas except the design that is intended to be printed. The screen is laid directly over the surface, whether it's a paper, a t-shirt, or a canvas tote bag. A line of ink is applied along the upper part of the screen. When pulling a squeegee across the screen, a thick ink, thick ink is forced through a stencil that is affixed to the fabric mesh screen to the paper below. Solid parts of the stencil block the ink from transferring through the screen onto the paper. Corita Kent is remembered for teaching at Immaculate Heart College and for her joyous, inspirational messages in her work, as we see here in Be Patient in the collection on the left. She was sensitive to the world around her, and she was also a peace and social justice advocate. Kent had a very open attitude to the definition of art. She adapted the bright colors and bold visual forms of graphic design and pop arts iteration into her art. She also incorporated texts including psalms, poetry, ads, and even Beatles lyrics. Kent turned to a vernacular language and the imagery that would be familiar to a wide general audience, and she infused, infused it with spirituality. In Be Patient, Kent takes advantage of the way the opaque colors of screen print inks layer on top of, each, of one another. She piles the phrase hip deep involvement and the inverted word ornery on top of an excerpt that reads to be, be patient by German poet Rainer Maria Rilke. In 1968, Kent took some time off. Perhaps she needed a reprieve from teaching, being in the national spotlight and the pressures of the church. She retreated to Cape Cod where she could watch the boats in the harbor. Soon after, she would leave the Immaculate Heart of Mary order. Always interested in modes of communication, Kent developed a series of prints of the alphabet inspired by maritime flags of the International Code of Signals. For the letter D, Kent's composition is based on the blue and yellow bands of the international flag for that letter, as seen on the chart on the right. She added a fanciful typeface and a passage by singer George Harrison, and it reads, So it's really that every moment's important, and just to dig it all. And by digging it all, you're naturally harmonizing with it, which is a form of appreciation of God. By the 1970s, Los Angeles boasted a rich environment of experimental contemporary printmaking through the establishment of graphic arts departments at universities and with the work of Corita Kent, but also print shops, Tamarin Institute, Cirrus Editions, and Gemini GAL, which we looked at in earlier talks. <clears throat> Los Angeles was racially segregated, and there were limited opportunities for exhibitions and access to residency programs for artists of color. Social issues were rarely the subjects of the work coming out of the mainstream print workshops at the time. In 1972, Franciscan nun Sister Karen Bocalero and artist Carlos Bueno, Antonio Ibinez, Milton 
Gerardo and Frank Hernandez established Arts Inc., an art classroom in the garage of the Sisters of St. Francis of Penance and Christian Charities Convent. The artists shared a love of printmaking and a desire for a site for community empowerment. This would grow to become self-help graphics and art seen here in its current location in East Los Angeles. Bucalero directed the organization until her death in 1997. Karen Bocalero grew up in Boyle Heights, California. She became a Franciscan nun and artist. Seen here, she, is, was, one of, uh, she was one of Perita Kent's student. Sister Karen honed her printmaking skills at Tyler School of Art at Temple University. Initially, she used her artistic skills to teach at a drug rehabilitation center at, in Los Angeles. Carlos Bueno and Albert Antonio Ibenez were trained in mural painting at the Academy of San Carlos in Mexico. Together, they shared a commitment to creating socially engaged art that would benefit the community. Their approach was very accessible and open to defining art and inclusive to people across the Chicano, Chicana, African-American and Asian-American communities. Shirley Bocalero's educational experience back with Corita Kent at the Progressive Immaculate Heart College and their inclusive collaborative art studio was an inspiration. Named Self-Help Graphics, the Art Center has served East Los Angeles, a largely Mexican heritage neighborhood through community building activities. The organization was founded and evolved during the growth of the Chicano art movement. Central programs have included art education, including on-site free art classes for use, and even art delivered to inner city public schools in the for former UPS truck named Barrio Mobile Art Studio, beginning in 1975. While beneficial for students, these opportunities provided valuable experience for teachers. Printmaking, of course, has been important with their studios, exhibitions, and the annual Day of the Dead commemoration. In 1972, before Self-Help Graphics Incorporation, the group initiated a community-wide celebration of Day of the Dead, which is one of their most important programs. It originated as a Mexican family-oriented tradition, a blend of Christian and indigenous cultural practices, involving cemetery vigils, food offerings, and home altars honoring the souls of deceased ancestors. This early November commemoration has a, transform, has a transformed more secular version that has moved to the public realm, now seen in cultural centers, galleries, and museums like the Fort Wayne Museum of Art. Their event featured a procession beginning with a Catholic mass at Evergreen Cemetery in Boyle Heights to self-help graphics where they were, there were exhibitions and altars by artists. Their focus was on the losses in the Vietnam War. The celebration was means of reclaiming indigenous identity and their celebration continues to be an annual event there. Self-Help Graphics instituted the Mexican-American Master Printers Program. It was a two-year training program to familiarize artists with woodcut, linocut, screen print, and intaglio. It was good preparation for artists seeking employment in advertising companies. In 1982, Self-Help Graphics answered another need. It was a need for continued professional and career development for artists. So they established the Experimental Screen Printers Atelier a residency program in which they invited 20 artists per year to create limited edition prints in a collaborative environment with a master printer. The print editions were split between the artists and self-help graphics for their archives and for sale at a reasonable price. Not only did this provide artists with experience and high quality prints to see, but this system also fostered collectors of largely Chicano artists. Um, Self-Help Graphics has created over 1,000 print editions. We have some examples of prints produced at Self-Help Graphics. Um, Esperanza Gama was born in Mexico and created this work, and we will look at another piece by her later. In a series of works, Gama depicted women as the four elements, earth, water, air, and here with fire woman. This is a striking image of a woman from which emerge beautiful blossoms. Yellow, orange, and pink flame-like tendrils frame her shoulders and face. The artist feels a deep connection with another element, um, Earth. Surrounding this image is an interesting model pattern in the background that I suspect may be a reference to Gama's paintings that she has made on tree bark, or mate, that we see on the right. This is a handmade, highly textured paper made by the Aztec and Maya people. 
Here are two other examples of prints made at self-help graphics. As you see, there hasn't been one style that has prevailed there. It wasn't unusual for imagery to be socially engaged or intending to instill cultural pride through representation or to empower women as seen here with the work of Christina Cardenas and Barbara Carrasco. These subjects follow the aims and goals of the Chicano art movement. Born in Mexico, Christina Cardenas came to the University of Arizona in Tucson for her master's degree in printmaking in 1990. She uses bold colors and imagery embracing what screen print can do so well. On the right, we immediately notice a, wa a large welcoming smile in a pop art style. Artist and muralist Barbara Carrasco immortalized Antonia Hernandez, who was best known as a lawyer, activist, and philanthropist. Hernandez's work helped protect vulnerable populations. She made a mark as a prosecutor in the infamous 1978 lawsuit in which Latina women were forcibly sterilized through coercion or without their cassette at the Los Angeles USC Medical Center. Some of the self-help graphics atelier participants went on to open their own print studios. Probably the most notable was Sam Coronado. Coronado received his BFA in painting and printmaking at University of Texas at Austin through the GI Bill. Always an organizer and community-minded, Coronado and fellow students founded the Chicano Student Association there. In addition to teaching at a community college, Coronado established a Texas network that an announced exhibition opportunities to benefit Mexican-American artists. This was the precedence to the National Association of Latino Arts and Culture. Coronado also co-founded the Mexi Arte Museum in 1984, which was recognized as the official Mexican and Mexican-American Art Museum of Texas. The Chicano art movement sought to celebrate their Mexican cultural heritage. Pre-conquest symbols and references were common. This beautiful purple screen print in copper ink is by Coronado. The image is Sky Sul, the eighth century ruler of the Maya city-state Kiriwa in now Guatemala. Coronado's image recalls the intricately carved sandstone boulder on the right. It is covered with glyphs and images that tell stories. It is known as Zoomorph P, and it is thought to feature an image of young Sky Sul sitting in the jaws of a turtle. The boulder is the largest at the site and is among the most renowned in Mesoamerica. It was named a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1981. Although he had worked in linoleum and woodcut, Coronado's two artisan residencies at Self-Help Graphics secured his devotion to printmaking, especially screen print. When he returned home, he used Self-Help Graphics as a model for a print shop in Austin, Texas in 1991. Coronado applied for local funding to bring in 12 artists to make prints. He figured this would be their first and last year. However, he applied for the second year and received funding, and then a third. Coronado is best remembered for his support of over 250 underrepresented artists through this nonprofit print residency program in Austin called Siri Project, which provided fellowships to artists to work in screen print with a master printer. It was in existence from 1993 until Coronado's death in 2013. Most of the artists had no experience in screen print. Some were printmakers, photographers, and sculptors, but most were painters. We see Sam Coronado looking at a work by Esperanza Gama again. Gama, who now lives in Chicago, often looked to her ancestral heritage, like Coronado. In Sol de la Noche, Maya, Gama portrays the powerful Maya jaguar god named Balam. This is a work by Sandra Fernandez created at Coronado Studio. Fernandez was born in the US but grew up in Quito, Ecuador. She returned to the U.S. in the 1980s. This screen print is inspired by a small wooden sculpture of the Virgin of Quito for the Basilica and Convent of San Francisco in Quito. It was carved by 18th century sculptor and painter Bernardo de Lagarda. In Lagarda's version, he used the iconography associated with the Virgin of the Apocalypse from the Book of Revelation. She is winged, she has a snake or a dragon, or maybe it's the devil at bay, and a crescent moon under her feet. Fernandez and Quito's public were taken with the amount of movement in the composition of the Madonna, almost like she is dancing. The text in the background of Fernandez's print is lifted from the 16th century Codex Mendoza 
that describes Aztec culture and stories. It is a source that the artist incorporates regularly. Coming of Age is a 16 colors screen print that Fernandez made at, for the Siri project. The scene is set against the panoramic backdrop of the program's home city skyline in Austin. The number 15 appears near the tr tree trunk and shines in the sky, alluding to the quinceanera celebration for the young 15-year-old girls transitioning into womanhood, and also marking Siri Project's 15th anniversary. The pictured girl wears a dress made of sewn corn husks that Fernandez fashioned and photographed. The face is taken from a baby doll, perhaps alluding to the last doll ceremony given, to the, given at the quinceanera. She carries a scepter made of dried ch red chili peppers, topped with a crown, signifying the logo and chop mark for Coronado Studio. While the print appears to be celebratory, words in green ink fill the tree trunk and present darker societal problems facing immigrants, including no jobs, coyotes, and haven't seen my children in five years. Fernandez added hopeful thoughts of respect, solidarity, and family in black ink. The faint blue script extending across the sheet is excerpted again from the Codex Mendoza. In 1998, Coronado began uh, collaborating with the Mexi RT Museum that provided an annual exhibition opportunity for the Siri Project artists. They also house an archive of all Siri Project prints. In 2013, the Fort Wayne Museum of Art acquired an archive of the available prints from Siri Project. Coronado's Siri Project sought to increase the vis visibility of all people of color in the art world, not only Latinx artists. Pictured here are prints by Vicki Meek, Sand Sandria Hugh, Bernice Applin Williams, and Samin Ishak Barat. Done in the spirit of pop art on the left is Montoya's screen print De, De Valgrande a Hollywood. It features the recognizable face of Shea Guevara, an Argentinian-born guerrilla rebel leader and powerful symbol of the Cuban Revolution. He was also popular in Chicano poster imagery as a revolutionary martyr. Montoya used the bold graphic language of advertising or, post, uh, or a poster design. He printed from Freddy Alborto's postmortem photograph of, the, of Che three times, recalling Andy Warhol's multiple Marilyns and other Hollywood stars. On the right is Esther Hernandez, as she replaces Andy Warhol's Brillo boxes or Campbell soup cans for a sun-made raisins familiar corporate logo. The packaging features a wholesome Lorraine Colette Peterson, a fruit picker from Fresno, California, who became synonymous with San Joaquin Valley's agribusiness. Hernandez satirically updated the word made for raid. The skeleton maiden is a, in traditional Mexican dress and wears a wrist monitor from the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement. The ingredients name Mexican indigenous groups in Oaxaca, Mexico, from where many undocumented farm workers in the U.S. come. And this was created during an increase in workplace raised during the George W. Bush administration. Carlos Fresquez and Sandra Fernandez continue to tackle the topic of the border and immigration. Carlos Fresquez takes a humorous view on borders. In a fairy tale, um, Carlos Fresquez brings together cultural images from his ancestral past and from Latin American folk, folk art. The card in the upper right is reminiscent of Mexican Loteria cards, a game of chance like bingo. Pictured is card number 37, El Mundo. He's the strong man carrying a burden, the figurative and literal weight of the world. In the upper left is an Aztec symbol, possibly a god. In the background is a world map with all the land masses colored in green, regardless of the country. However, there are lines delineating political borders and he inscribes the words, the world political. As we zoom up in a little closer, we see that the use of language is important in this work. TV cartoon characters George and Jane Justin communicate with <coughs> speech balloons. George talks in Spanish and Jane in English. A pink banner with Chinese writing says superhero. Even the Aztec head expels a curl of air like breath or speech. As George and Jane embrace, he exclaims, sin fronteras, meaning without borders. And she remarks, yay, we live in a wonderful world. The title of Fairy Tale begs the question, is this a hopeful dream or is the message cynical since both have their eyes shut? Are they simply oblivious to the borders illustrated on the map? 
Sandra Fernandez humanized the immigration debate by adding the individualized portraits of young adults who are in line as if part of a protest. Their faces are superimposed on a 1982 El Paso port of entry map made by the U.S. Geological Survey and U.S. Customs. The official document is written in English and in typeface. In contrast, the flowing handwritten script is in Spanish that pushes beyond the image. Again, Fernandez used the passage from the Codex Mendoza. She was a faculty member at the University of Texas at Austin and used students as models. Likely some of her students were dreamers, a term used to describe undocumented immigrants who were brought to the U.S. as children by their parents. The Texas Dream Act provides eligible documents, undocumented students, including DACA recipients, with access to in-state tuition and state financial aid. Fernandez included the iconic immigration caution sign illustrating silhouetted family members fleeing. This is located in the lower central, central area. In 1990, California Department of Transportation began posting these warning road signs to drivers along the corridor near the Mexico-U.S. border after about 100 pedestrian fatalities. Fernandez included another road sign in the upper right that shows three people running, but now they are wearing mortarboards, caps, and graduation gowns and are carrying rolled diplomas. An image of a bird charm was printed across the hair of, most, of the most prominent figure, as if in flight. The red bird was collaged and is tied with red stitches that escape and flow off the image into the borders. The bird takes the form of a Mexican folk charm known as a, as a milagro, which, we use, which was used for protection and good luck. In Ladder by Connie Arismendi, a stylized plant is surrounded by, a ti by tiny hash marks that seem to give visual form to energy or its life's force. The plant grows inside the outline profile of a head topped with a wreath of plant life. Plants can become potent symbols of rebirth and regeneration as they follow nature's cycles. Fernandez's print that we just looked at shows that the work coming out of the Siri project residencies were going beyond just purely screen print. She and Fernandez included collage and hand stitching. Arismendi's, Arismendi's flatter is printed on an unconventional paper made up of thin strips of plant material layered at right angles and pressed. The visible grid pattern contrasts with the fluid screen printed lines. In latter, the paper support extends a primordial quality to the work. After the sudden death of Sam Coronado in 2013, his print studio remained closed until 2020, which is now in use by Pepe Coronado, no relation to, to Sam, and Jonathan Reveloso. The two artists met at Sam's memorial service. Pepe Coronado was the first and unofficial master printer for Coronado Studio, and Jonathan was the last. At the invitation of Sam's wife, the two printmakers have been using the studio for their own work and are, and are documenting Sam's print archive from the Siri project and additional special edition prints. Sam Coronado was a founding member of the Latinx print collective Consejo Gráfico Nacional. Upon his passing, the group put together a portfolio made up of 15 contributing artists. You can see lots of heart-shaped imagery. Fittingly, the portfolio was entitled El Corazón, or The Heart, in, living, in loving memory of Sam Z. Coronado, 1946-2013. Sandra Fernandez's contribution was because Sam was all heart. In this print, we see a trembling etched red line resembling stitching. It outlines a large heart that is filled with handwritten personal tributes, beginning in English and transitioning into Spanish. In the background, she etched flower blossoms and small embossed heart-shaped milagro charms float heavenward into the margins. Here is the rest of the portfolio. There are repeated portraits of Sam in Juan Fuentes' angel in the lower register. She holds a crown reminiscent of Coronado Studios' chop mark. Out of the portfolio, this work entitled Hand Rope Helping Hand by Pepe Coronado stood out to me because of its sparse composition depicting cropped limbs with one hand giving another a helping hand. As a tribute to Pepe Coronado's friend, he wrote about Sam being a friend, mentor, and brother. Interestingly, while doing research on the internet, I ran across this painting by Sam Coronado on the right entitled Hand Rope, which adds even deeper significance to our print's imagery. 
in his screen print, Pepe zeroed in on the action and eliminated the specificity of the figure's face, perhaps a nod to Sam's desire to help all people. Thank you for joining me today. The talk seg this talk segues into the final print talk of the season that will be on Wednesday, May 8th at 1215. It is called An Array of Voices. We will be looking at print studios that were founded with the intent of working with underrepresented artists and to help advance their careers. This will include works um, from Crow's Shadow and Segura Art Studio, among others.